right, good evening. Welcome, welcome to our Christmas Eve service. What we're going to do is take our hymn book, and uh, before we actually begin singing, just a little reminder, if you did not go and get a candle, they are in the back when you enter in back here on this side, so I recommend go get one as for later on when we sing Silent Night together at the end. We turn the lights down, and we use the candles. All right, 199, let's go ahead and stand together as we sing, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, 199. <laughs> the herald angels sing glory to the newborn king peace on earth and mercy mild God and sinners reconcile joyful all ye nations rise join the triumph of the skies let the angelicals grow Christ is born in Bethlehem. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King. Christ by highest heaven adored, Christ the everlasting Lord, late in time behold him come, offspring of a virgin's womb, veiled in flesh the Godhead see, hail the incarnate deity, and with men to dwell, Jesus our Emmanuel, hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King on the last hail the heavenborn Prince hail the Son of righteousness life to all he brings when with healing in his wings mild he lays his glory sons of earth, born to give them second birth. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King. Good singing. Please remain standing for prayer. Our Father, as we approach thee today, we thank you for the opportunity you've given us tonight on this night that we celebrate the birth of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you for his eternality, that is, that he was before time. Without him was not anything made that was made. And yet, Father, in the framework of your will, of your guidance and direction, you chose a virgin and she conceived of the Spirit of God. And there on this night, Father, we celebrate that he was brought forth. He who is Emmanuel to be the savior of men came to, into this world, my God, to redeem us and we praise you for that. We ask that thou would help us in our attitude tonight to be very worshipful, to think, Father, of not the, the, the trinkets of the commercialized Christmas, but to think upon him who is the real meaning of it. We ask of thee that thou would help us to glorify thy name, and Lord, that you would be exalted. In Christ's name we pray, amen.
Matthew chapter 1. We're going to read a passage of scripture from Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost, and she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be, be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him Mary his, then took unto him his wife, and knew her not until she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. In the bleak midwinter, frosty wind made moan, her stood hard as stone. Snow had fallen, snow on snow, snow on snow. In a bleak midwinter long ago. cannot hold him, nor earth sustain. Heaven and earth shall flee away when he comes to reign. In a bleak midwinter, a stable place of I'm going to take our hymn books once again. Oh, I'm sorry. We're, yeah, yeah, we are. 217. 217. Oh, little town of Bethlehem, would you join me standing once again? 217. Oh, little town of Bethlehem. 217. Yet in thy dark 
extreme shine hath the everlasting light, the hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. For Christ is born of Mary and gathered all above. So while mortals sleep, the angels keep their watch of wandering love. O morning stars together proclaim the holy On the last stanza, O holy child of Bethlehem, descend to us, we pray. Cast not our sin and enter in, be born in us today. We hear the Christmas angels, the great glad tidings tell. Oh, come to us, abide with us, our Lord Emmanuel. Thank you. you may be seated. Another reading from scripture, not from the book of Luke. Luke chapter two, verses 14 through 20. <clears throat> Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which is come to pass which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad their saying which was told them concerning the child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. 
And the shepherds returned, glorifying God and praising, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, as it was told unto them.
nation praise its Lord evermore and evermore. Holy heights of heaven adore Him, angel hosts His praises sing. Thank you to each one who has participated so far. Music was just wonderful because it should be a worshipful night, a night of adoration for us. Uh, the world may uh, do its uh, joyful drinking and tomorrow wake up with a headache, but we should be people who soberly worship our God and ex exalt and glorify Him. Luke chapter number 2 is where we're going to go tonight. Now, we have heard from Matthew, and we have heard this morning from the beginning portions of Luke chapter 2. I want to take you beyond the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ by just a few days. Just a couple of days. If you, matter of fact, if you look in verse number 21 of Luke chapter number 2, you will see that we're going eight days from the time that the Lord Jesus Christ was born. And when eight days were accomplished for the circumcision of the child, his name was called Jesus, which was so named of the angel before he was conceived in the womb. When the days of her purification according to the law of Moses were accomplished, a little bit more time has gone by, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. And as it is written in the law of the Lord, every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy to the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. The same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, then he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel, and for the sign which shall be spoken against. We want to express our deepest appreciation on a night like this to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We live in a pretty dark world. And yet, tonight is a night when those of us who know Christ as our Savior are just a little happier than the world around us with all of its bleakness. We can look out at the political world and the religious world and we can see that there is just absolute turmoil that is going on. I want to take you back thousands of years to the time when Simeon was alive. 
I want you to think about him. He observed the events of the last days. He had been, and they had been majestic before him. I want you to think that maybe word got to him, maybe by the Holy Spirit, of Mary's pregnancy that had come to an end and that Christ was born in a manger. The Lord Jesus Christ, born in a lowly stable, wrapped in uh, tightly wound strips as the Orientals do for their firstborn, in, for their newborn infants, wrapped tightly around him, called swaddling clothes, and lying in a manger, an animal stall. And angels attended the birth and couldn't contain themselves as they announced the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ saying, glory to God in the highest and on peace uh, and, and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. Shepherds, not just any shepherds. Shepherds who had been preparing and watching over the sacrificial sheep in Bethlehem. Sheep that would be used in the temple. Sheep that would be offered in sacrifice as a type of the Lord Jesus Christ, to shed their blood, to give their life without spot and without blemish. And they heard the angels sing, and they heard the announcement of his birth, and they came running, and amazed, they came to Mary, his mother. And Mary herself was amazed. The Bible says she kept all these things in her heart, and pieced all the things together and attempted to understand them. Imagine what it must have been like to have been Mary. You, you hear an angel announce to you that you're going to be with child. And you carry a child, having not known a man. And you know that his name is going to be Jesus. They're going to call him Emmanuel, but... How could this be? Imagine what it must have been like to be Joseph. And here is Simeon. This man of God, who's around the temple all these years, and God has told him that he wouldn't die until he saw the salvation of Israel or the Savior of Israel. There's this group in Israel that was looking and waiting the coming of the Messiah. In Luke chapter 2 and verse 38, it says this, And she, Anna, coming in that instant, eight days after Christ's birth, gave thanks likewise unto the Lord, and spake of him to all them that looked for redemption in Israel. So there was a group of individuals, not a large group, but a group of individuals that were expecting the Lord Jesus Christ to be born, the Messiah. Everybody else was going about their daily routine. Christmas Eve. I would expect that the stores would be closed by now, wouldn't you? But maybe there's some that are still open. And I would expect that even if they were open until midnight on this particular night, there would be some people still fighting over what gift to buy. Kids are kind of excited tonight, would you say? Uh, I noted that the children this morning in this morning service, they were just a little bit wound up. Just, just a tad. Not that you Sunday school teachers would have given them candy or anything like that. But most everybody goes about their business and they don't think about he who was born on this night. All they think about is the party. All they think about is the food. As a matter of fact, I was listening to someone who is of authority, but I don't know who they are, so they're not much of an authority to me. And they were talking about what Christmas means, and what Christmas means is food and fellowship, and didn't mention one moment the Lord Jesus Christ. But I want you to notice something on the drive home tonight there are fewer and fewer decorations that exhibit anything about a babe in a manger. Less and less and less. 
That's exactly what you would expect. Exactly what the world is doing. It's not about the Lord Jesus Christ. It's about merchandising. It's about the party. It's about a couple of days off from work. Certainly days off from school. But is it about the Lord Jesus Christ? Evidently, they didn't understand. That is the majority of people. Evidently, there was a group of Israelites, however, that did believe the Old Testament scriptures and the prediction uh, the first, of the first advent of the Messiah. And perhaps verses like I'm about, what I'm about to read maybe, maybe vexed their soul and thrilled their mind. In Hosea chapter 13, verse 14, I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. O death, I will be thy, pla- I will be thy plagues. O grave, I will be thy destruction. Repentance shall be hid from mine eyes. Or Psalm 130 in verse 8, And he shall redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Or Psalm 49, 15, But God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave, for he shall receive me. Selah. Isaiah 54, 8, In a little wrath I hid my face from thee for a moment, but with everlasting kindness will I have mercy on thee, saith the Lord thy Redeemer. In Isaiah 59, 20, The Redeemer shall come to Zion, and unto them that turn from transgression in Jacob, saith the Lord. Why would those verses be important? Well, Israel was steeped at the time that Christ was born, was steeped in political and spiritual darkness. Has the world ever recovered from political and spiritual darkness? Well, not until the day that pastor is going to preach about next week, Lord willing. When the Lord Jesus Christ returns in a name given unto him, King of kings and Lord of lords, and a banner upon his breast. Think for a moment. God had wanted Israel through Moses that, uh, had warned Israel through Moses that one day they would reap what they would sow. In Deuteronomy chapter number 28 and verse number 1, he laid down the principle of blessing. Here's what he said. And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently to the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to do all his commandments, which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth. And it continues on for several verses, telling how Israel would be prospering, how their agriculture would be abundant, uh, how their children, children would rise, how their enemies would flee from them, and so on and so forth. But then he gives a warning in verse 15 of Deuteronomy uh, 28. But it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. And just the exact opposite of the blessings, their fields are going to fail, their offspring are going to fail, they're going to run from their enemies, and it's going to be utter destruction and chaos in Israel. The awful results of that were that Israel did not listen and went into deep sin and to idolatry. Let me give you eight points. Very just sentences without preaching much about them. What is the history of Israel? What what happened to her? Because of her idolatry, well, she suffered Babylonian captivity about 50 years from 588 to 536 B.C. And Jerusalem was, had lain in ruins and most of the population had been deported. The only ones left were the old and the feeble and the infirm. Secondly, she suffered from the Persian Empire. About 200 years, and under the, sea, the reign of Cyrus, they were allowed to turn, return to Jerusalem but only about 42,360 went back. Next, Alexander the Great, the Greek Empire, occupied the Promised Land for nine years from 330 to 321 B.C. 
And then for the next 120 years, from 321 to 198 BC, the Egyptians became the strong hand over the Jewish people during uh, this time, the Jews, for the most part, lost their language, and the Old Testament translation called the Septuagint had to be written. Fifthly, the Syrians ruled for about 40 years, 198 to 166 B.C. And one by the name of Antiochus, Anti, uh, Antiochus Epiphanes, or better known in that time as the Madman, I would like to have that name. Oppressed the Jews, sought, the, sought to exterminate their religion and their culture. Is there anything new under the sun? Hmm. He forced them to live like Greeks. He nearly destroyed Jerusalem twice and entered the temple, desecrating it by sacrificing a pig on its altar. Can you imagine that? The temple finally closed. No worship. Israel experienced independence after two years of struggle, led by Matthias Maccabees uh, and his son Judas, or John, the hammer. This independence lasted about 126 years. The Romans occupied Israel from 40 B.C. to 70 A.D. And a fellow by the name of Antipater, an Idumean, not even a Jew, rose to power. And soon after a series of tragic events, his son, you'll know who he is, he's called Herod. Oh, Herod was made governor of Galilee, and later in 40 B.C. he was made king of Palestine by the Roman Senate. Herod's rule was couched in treachery, murder, suspicion, paranoia. He was famous for killing most of his family and his wives. An awful man. And now the Roman Empire, under the emperor Caesar Augustus, sought to raise the taxes on his empire, what he would term the world. Israel, whose custom it was to return to a city reflecting the tribe of your birth, sets the scene of the Messiah's entry upon the stage, born of a virgin in Bethlehem. Put yourself in this scene that is happening. Living in Nazareth, they needed to travel down to Bethlehem. But they weren't the only ones moving and traveling. Our grandkids at Thanksgiving said to us, hey, there's going to be a party in January for my mom and dad. And we are uh, we're going to have a 50th birthday and a 25th anniversary party for them at church in the afternoon. Be there. Okay, so their house is full because everybody's home for Christmas, Christmas break. There's no place for Nana and Poppy in the inn. <laughs> and when I called for our reservations uh, in a hotel that we generally stay at, and the price was not normally what we pay, I said, what's going on at Penn State University? And they said, yeah, there must be something going on because the prices are up there. Oh, I see that you're a gold member of this particular uh, branch. And I said, yes, I am. And he said, okay, I can knock $70 off. Let you know where the price was at. Hmm. No room in the inn. Why? The whole country was set in motion. Uh, today was supposed to be one of the busiest days on the highway. I don't know if it was or not, because we were smarter than the average bear and stayed off the roads. We traveled just a little bit. But think of people coming and going and coming and going and coming and going. And then there's this Simeon guy. He was expecting something. 
the Jews had the idea that they were never, ever in bondage to anybody. If you remember reading through the Gospel of John, you will find that there is this statement when the Pharisees are addressing the Lord Jesus Christ. They said, we've never been in bondage to any man. Well, that is kind of like pie in the sky, wishful thinking. They are under the Roman rule, uh, under the Roman thumb. They have a man that is their king who is not even Jewish. He has gotten there by intrigue. He's gotten there by bribery. He's gotten there by knowing the right people, by worming his way in to the best parties and the best people in town, so to speak, if you will. And then there's the Simeon. He's been about the temple, waiting. Was he a student of the word of God? I don't know. When we had the opportunity to be in Israel with the Pelletiers, the Murrays, and Laura and I, and a bunch of other people, and we went to the Wailing Wall, and Pastor Jaquo said to me, have you seen the little three rooms down on the side? They'll be over on this side, as we're looking at the Wailing Wall right in front of us. He said, come on, put your hat back on, let's go down there, I want to show you what these rooms are. And immediately upon walking into those rooms, I thought of Simeon. There were the scrolls, ancient scrolls, being handled with delicacy. Some of the rabbis were singing, some of the rabbis were praying, some of the rabbis were arguing. And Pastor Jaco said, come step up here and look down. And as we looked through the very thick plexiglass, we could see the scrolls, scroll after scroll after scroll after scroll in this library. My mind went to Simeon. Was this place in existence? That wall was in existence. Was this place in existence? Did he spend time in this room? Was this where he got his information? Is this where in prayer... The Spirit of God revealed unto him that he should not see death until the Messiah was born. Simeon, hoping upon hope that the long-expected Messiah would be born, is hearing the rumblings of one Elizabeth, a priest, couldn't talk. And when his child was born, he said his name should be John. Where do I find that in Scripture? Where do I go? Behold, there was a man in Jerusalem named Simeon. Some presumptions we have about him. Some people suppose him to be the son of one by the name of Hillel a distinguished teacher in Jerusalem and president of the Sanhedrin. But yet this is conjecture. It's, it's not fact. We, we can't prove it. Some also suppose that he himself was the president of the Sanhedrin, but we don't know this. It's never revealed to us in any literature or even in the scripture. But what we do know is this, that there were hundreds of men by the name of Simeon in Israel, and the Lord noticed only one man over the others for this particular reason. Simeon was known for his character. But the Bible says he was just, equitable in character, innocent, holy, and he was righteous. And he was devout. He was careful about his walk with God, suggesting that he fully consecrated himself unto the Lord. And he was waiting with confidence and patience. Waiting. Waiting for who? And why? Israel was in deep sin. Oh, Israel had thought about it while she was in Babylonian captivity, and she gave up, mostly once and for all, the idolatry that she had brought herself to. She had learned her lesson, but still there was no righteousness within them. Isaiah was careful to describe their righteousness as being that of filthy rags. Later on, even the Apostle Paul says to the Jew, you go about to establish your own righteousness. In Romans chapter 10. 
Simeon, with his close walk with the Lord, had some insight into some things. How many days had he gone to the temple and returned only to hope for another day? Can you imagine this? He knows because he's probably studied the book of Daniel. He can count the number of years and the number of days that were predicted by Daniel for the coming of the Messiah. It's getting closer and closer. Could this be the day? I can just see Simeon standing there in the temple and watching the the parade of children, infants being brought by their parents to the temple for circumcision and dedication. Could this be the day? And he goes away one more day, not disappointed, still hoping. But yet the day of the Messiah's birth was upon him. And the Lord allowed this man to have a promise of not dying. And now greater anticipation has built as each day brings him closer to threescore years and ten or seventy years old. This aged man with a quick eye peers at the babies on each occasion and on this particular day, the Spirit of God seems to touch his heart. Verse 27, and he came by the Spirit into the temple. In other words, the Spirit of God nudged him, spoke to his heart. And when the parents brought in the child to do for him after the custom of the law, on that day, Joseph and Mary were fulfilling the law. In Numbers chapter 18, verses 15 to 16, it says, everything that openeth the matrix in all flesh which, shall bring, which they bring unto the Lord, whether it be of man or beast, shall be thine. Nevertheless, the firstfruits of man shalt thou surely redeem, and the firstlings of the unclean beast shalt thou redeem, and those that are to be redeemed from the, a month old shalt thou redeem, according to thine estimation for the money of five shekels, after the shekel of the sanctuary, which is twenty gera. The act was in a memory of the redemption of Israel out of Egypt and the Lord's strong hand at the death of the firstborn among the Egyptians. And now Joseph and Mary have made their way for their purification ceremony and the child's redemption and dedication. And it says that the Holy Spirit stirred Simeon to go into the temple in anticipation that day. Verse 28, Then took he him up in his arms and blessed God and said what bliss must have filled the heart of Simeon how long had he gone to the temple in hopes that the Messiah was the one that would be walking through the doors that day only to be waiting another day to take him up to take up this child in his own hands what it must have been like for him to peer into the face of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. We can only estimate. We can only guess. Holding this babe, whom we know is the creator, and he knew was going to be the redeemer. Can you think of the awesomeness of being able to hold him that without him was not anything made that was made? Have you thought about that? Simeon is holding the creator in human form in his hands and peering out 33 years further the one who would die a cruel death at Calvary's cross. Redemption. Perhaps running through his mind is Genesis chapter 49, verse 18. I have waited for thy salvation, O Lord. Now his eyes, his literal eyes, had seen the salvation of Israel. Nay, not only Israel, but the whole world. Salvation is in a person. The God-man, Christ Jesus. Not in an institution, 
Not in Judaism, not in Protestantism, not in Catholicism, not in Islam, not in whatever religion man tries to bring about. It's in a person. Simeon was holding him in his hands. Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Jesus, the Savior. Jehoshua. Jehovah is salvation, the Savior of mankind, the one through whom salvation is exclusively granted to all who believe in him. Acts 4.12, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. This salvation is universally offered to all men. Luke chapter 2 and verse number 31. It says there, which thou hast prepared before the face of God, how many people? All. Did you know that you're included in on those alls? No matter what nation, no matter what race, no matter what geographical location you might be in, no matter if you're rich or poor or in between, all. Prepared, which means sent before all mankind, both Gentiles, a light to lighten the Gentiles in verse number 32, and Israel in verse number 32, and the glory of thy people Israel. Simeon addressed Mary and Joseph, and he blesses them, and he pronounces wishes of happiness and prosperity inward and outwardly upon them. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, the child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel, and for a sign which shall be spoken against. Set, intended, for the fall, the downfall, the crash, and the rising again, the resurrection of many in Israel. Then the most revealing statement of tragedy, approaching, uh, tragedies approaching storm, comes in verse 35. Yea, a sword shall pierce through thy son, with thy, thy own soul also. Simeon, holding the babe in his arms, looks at Mary and says, a sword's going to pierce through your own soul. She would suffer the grave effects of what so many had suffered, the death of their child at the hands of cruel men who would try and convict one who is innocent. And at that same time, and at that same cross, the thoughts of men would be revealed. Verse 35. Hmm. Truly, this is the Son of God, cried the centurion. Truly. So when we speak devotionally like this, we still have to ask ourselves the question when we come to the end, so what? What do I do with it? Here is a man who trusted what the word of God had to say. His hope was set because of what he read, what he understood, and how the spirit of God had spoken to his heart. There are many today who hear and turn away. Just the other day, we were passing out some tracks. One lady took the track and looked at it and handed it back. And I said, oh, you don't like that one? I have a different one for you. I said, it's got a different picture on the front. And she said, no, I don't want that one either. I said, you don't want anything of the Lord? And she shook her head and said, no. Simeon would not have said no. Simeon would have received what the word of God had to say. So here we are, Christmas Eve. It's a joyous time for us. We give gifts to each other based upon the fact that God gave his eternal gift to us. We have given gifts in the past where people have said, I don't like what you gave me. If you want, to, want me to answer what they get from us now, the answer is nothing. Okay. 
Do men, will men seal their fate tonight? Listening to the carols, watching stories. Maybe some of them even went to church. And irrespective if the preacher knows Christ or not, if he read the Christmas story, they heard the word of God. And they're responsible for it. What will they do with Christ? A greater gift has never been given to mankind, for God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. A greater gift has never been given to mankind, the redemption of his soul. Simeon looked at the babe, and he declared this, Now let your servant die, for I have seen the salvation. I have seen the Savior. I've seen the Redeemer. Simeon was ready to die. How about you? How about you? Where are you? You need Christ as your Savior. If you're listening or if you're here in the auditorium, there is no other name given among men whereby men must be saved. No other name other than the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I trust this Christmas time that you will worship him who deserves your entire heart, your entire love, your entire soul, that you will give yourself completely to him. The book I'm currently reading about the Welsh revival, the author of the book wasn't saved when he was watching and reporting on the revival that was going on there in 1904. And he walked into a church in Aberdeen, unsaved, observing. He said, and after about five hours of watching what was going on and listening to the testimony, something began to burn within his own heart. And he finally found himself crying out and pleading for mercy and trusting Christ as his Savior he found relief and peace, and he said, I've never prayed such in my life. He said, I'm thankful for all the Sunday school verses that I had learned because they came pouring forth from my lips. He said, but then something shocking came. A lady who he had respected, a very old woman, came up to him and said, I am rejoicing that you now have found peace. Now give your entire life to Christ. And he said, can't I think about this for a while? And she said, no, sir, I'm going to, I want you to, God has told me you should give your whole life to Christ. He argued just a little bit more, and finally, after several minutes, he surrendered and gave his whole life to Christ. Should it be any different with us once we trust Christ as Savior? Think of these young people at an early age. Oh, I wish that I hadn't wasted years, but gave my life to Christ completely. Not only in salvation, but also in service for him. Because he did so much for me. Simeon became satisfied in the Lord. How about you? Father, we thank you for this time tonight. And we praise you for what, all that you have done for us. We trust that thou would bless. Help our thoughts to be about you. Help our way, my Heavenly Father, to be glorifying unto thee. We trust, my Heavenly Father, that Thou would use your, your Word, that the Spirit of God would help us, my Heavenly Father, to be what we ought to be. And at this Christmas time, Lord, help us to think on You. That will thank You in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time, if you take your candles... Turn them on. They've been tested. Some are brighter than others, but they do all function. We're going to have the lights turned down at this time. And we're to sing Silent Night Through twice. Just the first verse, as most of us should know it. Silent night, holy night. Oh.
Christmas, everyone.